Welcome to Colorectal Surgery Virtual Education Series. We have Dr. Bethan Schenker and Andrea Trock um, with us tonight. Um, I'll quickly introduce our um, uh, guests. Dr. Schenker grew up in Philadelphia. She attended the University of Rochester, earning both uh, an MD and Master's in Science in the field of HPV. She completed her general surgery residency at Rutgers University in 2013. After graduation, she moved to Orlando for an advanced colorectal surgery fellowship, followed by colorectal residency. She's ecstatic to be a part of the Trinity Health uh, and Arbor family and serves as the associate program director for the colorectal residency. Her clinical interests are robotic surgery, uh, complex anorectal surgery, and pelvic floor pathology. She developed the created fellowship program at Trinity Health, which she, which is tailored to each trainee's professional goals, wellness, and provides professional coaching. Uh, Ms. Andrea Torok has been a Michigan resident most of her life. Uh, she graduated from Michigan State University with a degree in psychology prior to obtaining her nursing degree in 2003. She has been certified in wound and ostomy management since 2006. She's currently employed uh, with Trinity uh, IHA, colon and rectal surgery as a wound ostomy nurse. Andrea has worked in several uh, settings, including inpatient, outpatient clinical settings, wound centers, and uh, in the field as a wound ostomy nurse. She also functioned as a nurse educator in uh, wound and ostomy management for Trinity Health working with nurses, families, and patients in management with difficult stomas and strategies to maximize independence for the patient. And you most um, was most shaped by an assignment at Billings Clinic Hospital in Montana in 2010. Uh, she worked with uh, Native American and Indigen populations to help creative uh, resources and effectively teach patients with limited resources and significant comorbidities. Um, thank you both for joining us, Dr. Schenker. Thank you. Take it away. <laughs> thank you. Are you? Uh, thank, thank you for the nice introduction. I'm ready yes. to just hear Andrea talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, do, are you still able to see my screen? Uh, yes, we can right. see your screen. You uh, can yeah. go to oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, PowerPoint. Perfect. All right, sounds good. Um, so uh, again, thank you for having us. This is a, a picture of uh, the hospital uh, Trinity Health that we work at. This is Trinity Health Ann Arbor uh, located in Ypsilanti. Um, and uh, it looks like here like a giant parking lot, but there's, <laughs> there's other buildings there uh, inside the tower. Uh, mind you, uh, uh, we are in Michigan and I promise you this picture was not taken in February. Um, so uh, the goals of this talk, uh, before we started, I had said the goals of this talk was that we would talk about all the problems I created in making a stone man all the way that Andrea fixes them. So that's sort of the simplified version. But we're going to talk about managing a complicated stoma. You know, what can go wrong? What makes the stoma a challenge? You know, from creation uh, to early complications to late complications. What are the different types of stomas? How do you standardize documentation of your stoma and the care? And what are some examples of complications of intervention? All right, you are probably familiar with this from the ASCARS textbook, uh, which was, this chapter was written by my colleague, Mike McGee at the University of Michigan. These are common complications. What's interesting when you see charts like this, you see a huge ring. Most complications are kind of well captured in the hospital for national quality databases. But when the patient leaves the hospital and becomes an outpatient, it's much harder to capture these complication rates. So you see these wide ranges reported. So you see retraction, uh, peristomal hernia, stoma prolapse, necrosis, peristomal skin problems, and total complications ranging anywhere from like, you know, no percent to uh, 70%. And probably um, the reality would be probably about 50% of people with stoma have some issue that needs to be addressed. Here are some images depicting some of these problems we're going to get more um, in depth about. Stoma prolapse, mucocutaneous separation, stomal varices, peristomal hernia, uh, necrosis, pyodermic gangrenosum, fistulas. Now, I have yet to see a fistula with googly eyes, I admit it. This is from... <laughs> a blog, Thomas the Stoma, uh, and from a lady living in the UK. 
And I, you know, if you look um, at social media and on the internet, there is not a lot of um, education from like institutions or um, or societies uh, that go into depth for patients with specific problems. But people have sort of reached out and created their own platforms and blog um, as a way that people get information, which is great for community. Sometimes not always accurate information. So anyway, I really liked um, her blog, uh, Tavit the Stoma, and of course I like that image. All right, and stenosis and retraction. All right, what are factors that lead to a difficult stoma? Uh, why and when an ostomy is created, patient factors and type of ostomy can all lead to issues um, in stoma creation and care. Um, so emergency stomas, uh, obviously when we're doing an emergent surgery that person may not have time to the award uh, care nurse beforehand for marking or for education. And you're also talking about uh, an emergent situation uh, where they may have unforgiving anatomy, uh, shortened mesentery. We've learned a lot about mesentery as an organ uh, over the last 10 years uh, during uh, acute events, times of inflammation. It you know has its own cascade of inflammatory markers. It gets swollen, it gets shortened makes it more challenging during an operation uh, to bring up an ostomy as obviously the ostomy itself is tethered to the mesentery and its blood supply and edema. Um, even if the, an ostomy nurse can see somebody going to an emergency surgery, you have change in, morpholo uh, change in morphology, distension, other issues that make it difficult um, to mark. You know, with an elective stoma, not only do you get somebody and uh, maybe with their uh, normal belly or close to normal belly, uh, but they have, we have time to modify some risk factors, uh, you know, uncontrolled glucose, cigarette smoking, uh, depending how long it's going to be stretched out for some weight nutrition management to optimize that. Uh, but another thing that we don't specifically address here is that uh, we should have time to learn about ostomy care beforehand, which is a big uh, mental health barrier. I think when uh, I think all of us have come across those patients who refuse an ostomy or, or don't want but uh, obviously don't want one. And they have uh, really time to get that education and receive information on undergarments, exercise, sexual activity, uh, I think which plays a role into mentally preparing them for it and also getting them ready to take care of themselves afterward. All right, patient factors that contribute to a difficult stoma anatomically are obesity. Um, this may include an ostomy in the lower quadrant where the lower part of the abdomen uh, the paniculi is thicker and the abdominal wall is thicker, so it can be harder to bring an ostomy through that. You may be more reluctant to if you think that'll make it harder to reverse if you're planning on something temporary. Previous abdominal um, surgical scars, contours, bony prominences. Um, at previous surgery, if I have a patient tomorrow who had some sort of reconstruction for breast surgery she couldn't remember, and it seems that she had um, some sort of uh, uh, tram flap or reconstruction, with her left side of her rectus muscle. So, you know, that was, you know, playing detective and figuring uh, that out for surgery so you can make decisions. Um, and again, talking about their mental health and being prepared to deal with that aspect of it as well. The types of fecal elimination for a colostomy we're creating over 120,000 a year. You know, the end colostomy can be a temporary or permanent fecal diversion. The loop colostomy is more often thought of for temporary diversion, uh, but of course can also become permanent depending on the situation. Loop colostomies can allow for venting of that distal segment if there's an obstruction or a blockage. Transverse loop colostomies uh, can be the easiest to make, but have the highest rate of prolapse, uh, more unsightly for the patient to deal with may impact more on their mental health, um, and typically larger in that upper quadrant. For the ileostomy, this can also be permanent or temporary. Loop ileostomies more often uh, we think of as temporary, but again can become permanent. Uh, there's a liquid uh, nature to the output that can lead to more problems with uh, pouching. We also want to think about your patient. Uh, you know, if they have heart failure, or kidney issues, and fluid status is really critical to their other health. Um, uh, comorbidities that they're managing, you may want like a, a temporary diverting ostomy, even though, you know, they both have pros and cons, it may be better with some fluid management there. The loop end ostomy is where you uh, divide uh, the colon, let's say you have your staple line uh, over here, uh, but, but for like inflammation or anatomy, you're not going to be 
able to bring up that end of the ostomy through the abdominal wall and it becomes easier and less portion on the ostomy itself for the blood supply just to bring up like a knuckle of ostomy uh at, you know several centimeters or more proximal to where you divided it so that is an end loop and when you mature it it looks like um a loop ostomy um but you want to be aware of that that that's actually like a dead end uh on the other side and make sure you scope that and, and know that that's there um and and Loop is when you're bringing up your end and your mucus fistula through the same aperture. So you essentially reverse that, uh, uh, like a loop ostomy, uh, through the same uh, aperture. But again, it's completely divided. Uh, so uh, other configurations of ostomies that we create. You also want to think about maybe creating a template or having a way between yourself. Uh, primary care doctors, other people like acute care surgery who may be also creating an ostomy. It can just make communication easier um, and uh, may let you know if you're seeing somebody who had a stoma created like 10 years ago um, and is coming in with new problems, sort of what they had and what's going on. So the year location of stoma was created, where if it was at your home institution, what surgery they had that led to the creation and uh, the, if it was an emergency or an elective. Um, reason to create this stoma, you know, you may see a stoma and think it's something reversible, but you want to be aware if they had neurogenic bowel or other issues that may then maybe ha uh, have like physiologic dysfunction of their colon of what that was. Um, if they have plans for reversal, you want to know that. And for your first meeting, you're going to collect all that information up front. You know, I think if you're seeing somebody more on a continuing basis, you want to know if they've seen a stoma nurse in the last 12 months. If it's like a long-standing ostomy and they're starting to need to see somebody, it makes you think that something else could be going on there. Um, and you want to really prompt them to know if there's changes in the stoma itself, such as bulges, retraction, uh, difficulty, pouching, bleeding, uh, changes in their stool coming out of it. You want to record the last colonoscopy if they still have colon or even if they still have rectum, their last big sigmoidoscope, and you want to take a, a picture of that for documentation. Um, we have a lot of studies, mostly in uh, wound care nursing journals, that show that patients are really poor at reporting a lot of changes in their stoma that may indicate something else is going on. So uh, there's many validated questionnaires they could fill out, like in the waiting area before they come in for an office appointment or in the hospital uh, regarding like bleeding changes, weeping skin, like new lesions, anything else that they're seeing uh, that can help you figure out like why something's changed and what the underlying cause is. Regardless of the problem, you want to think about the patient. Um, and so you want to think about the demographic. You know, I have a patient who um, uh, unfortunately was a no-show. She's in a domestic violence situation um, at home and has, uh, you know, been in and out of some drug rehab. And right now she is has not seen a word to me nurse in a long time and is getting all her supplies from the emergency room. So it's sort of understanding the demographics of your patient. Um, if you're creating a new ostomy, um, unless there's a real reason why they can't take care of it from a uh, relationship and mental health standpoint, you want to really provide that person with support to take care of their own ostomy. Uh, there's a good amount of literature that show that people with ostomies are more likely to get divorced if they're married and or lose a relationship and that if that partner becomes a primary caretaker of their ostomy they're likely not to re-engage in a re romantic relationship and so that could be like a, a marker of other things obviously going on but having that person feel competent and independent in their health care uh, is important and of course you want to know nutritional status uh bmi smoking all the other things that we want to know when we're taking care of stomas and they're having problems and especially if we're thinking about a all right, we're getting to the important person. We're getting to Andrea in a here. Uh, stoma complications, you know, early or late complications. A lot of times in surgery, we think of early complications as within 30 days. Uh, but really, I think with a stoma, we're also thinking about whether or not they need to go back to the OR for revision. So we're really thinking maybe sometimes under two weeks in those cases. Uh, so an early complication would be like a mucocutaneous separation, a stomal necrosis or ischemia. Stomal retraction, some of these things could just be uh, uh, non-emergent or emergent. Later complications, again, harder to capture that percentage um, or incident in the population, but that's the stenosis, um, the prolapse, the hernias, and the abscesses and fistulas. 
So, um, you know, what the complication is and how emergent it is, um, is a big aspect of managing stomach later. All right. So an early stomach complication, I talked about the mucocutaneous separation. Um, it, we see it with diabetics for nutrition. People on steroids or chemotherapy are more likely uh, to see this. And I'll let, um, you know, Andrea speak a little bit to how she manages or thinks about mucocutaneous separation. Okay. Hello. Thank you. Um, so when we manage this, you know, we, we need to heal the area. It's separated at the junction away from the stoma. And so the big um, key is going to be absorption because that's considered a wound. Once we have a wound, we need to treat it like a wound. And so some separation is very minor. It can be treated with like a pectin powder, um, a skin sealant, but often we have to put a, a wound dressing in there. And the key is going to be absorption. It's, uh, it's, we need to keep that drainage from them breaking the seal because then we have a lot bigger issues in the skin around it. So um, we always notify the surgeon right away about that just because there can be uh, complications that follow that. Um, you know, it, uh, so we always monitor that. Most of the time they heal without incident, but it's just something to always have on the back burner for your surgeon that, you know, we have a separation. So, right. So, yeah. So, severity of it and then uh, that local wound care. Stoma ischemia, you may be reported about like an ischemic or dusky stoma. Uh, and this could be hard to know, uh, like what the person who may be calling you is actually seeing. If they're seeing like a plum colored, um, sorry to ruin plums for everybody, a plum colored stoma, it could just be venous um, congestion. Um, and that's mo the most common thing we're probably going to see. The arterial flow is fine, but from the post surgical situation, there, you're getting a lot of congestion. You may want to make sure that that fascia opening isn't too tight. Um, uh, and if it was fine when you created it and is a little bit snug as the edema goes down, it's going to be just fine. Uh, but venous congestion, nothing really there but supportive care. But if they are actually having ischemia, you want to first assess the person and say, hey, is this person hemodynamically dynamically stable or not? Um, especially for a thicker abdominal wall, maybe you shear some mesentery for you get through. If it is a really like focal area, that may be something you just watch and let flop off. Um, but things you can do for a stable patient is at the bedside. I know we talk about the test tube test, uh, but when I needed to evaluate something uh, at the bedside, uh, like in an ICU patient, I would just bring in a gastroscope to look. Um, uh, or, you know, if they're stable on the floor, our GI doctors will ultimately just look with the scope to get uh, an idea of the extent of uh, uh, necrosis or ischemia at maybe a CT angio. And it, for a hemodynamically stable patient, of course, you just want to know uh, the extent of the ischemia, what their blood pressure and other factors are that are correctable, um, and uh, decide if it's extending, you know, uh, beyond the fascia into the abdomen, if you're going to do uh, supportive care, take care of the underlying problem, or if you need to go back uh, to the operating room. When they're too dynamically unstable, um, you want to think if there was something more catastrophic going on, if they're showering clots, is more of the bowel viable or unviable uh, or not viable. And that may be a case you don't have time to necessarily do this evaluation and you need to prepare the family that you're going to sort of be doing more of an exploration. But understanding the degree of this in the end underlying causes uh, and thinking about your abdominal wall and how you pull that stoma through the abdominal wall. So for thicker abdominal walls to prevent sh like uh, like shearing that mesentery off, we will typically put in a small wound retractor. Sometimes put a little lube on the side of that wound uh, uh, retractor so that when we're bringing up the stoma, it's going through a lubricated uh, like uh, surface and we're decreasing our chance of uh, causing uh, some shearing in that mesentery. Uh, for retraction, you know, early retraction, I had a gentleman, uh, Steve, who had a heat transplant, uh, obesity, obstruction, other medical comorbidities, low ejection fraction. And he ultimately uh, needed uh, like a Hartman's procedure, sigmoid resection and ostomy or palliative care. We had sort of all, um, all types of specialties involved with him and that decision making. He did go to the operating room. He did have a uh, pretty quick hypocutaneous separation being on his amount of immunosuppression and developed the 
we had our in-hospital wordostomy care nurses uh, help manage that along with our, our cornea surgeons or our trauma team, actually. Uh, ultimately, we had to take him back and refight him, but still had the same issue on the other other side. Uh, and so with his um, comorbidity, that was uh, issue we were worried about with the retraction. Uh, I have another example. I'll talk about that. I think I put this slide out of order, but it's never too early to talk about dermatologic issues. So these are common late complications with uh, stripping and dermatitis and fungal infections we see. And I'll have to, uh, Andrea, I think I'll have you speak to more how you manage these. Hey, this is probably the number one, or this is the number one uh, complication that we manage. So um, a lot of times when patients come to us, especially ileostomies, try to see them seven to 10 days after discharge because of these issues. Um, a lot of it is just, you know, they're getting home, there's some operational error, things like that. But um, the big thing when we look at these, especially um, the dermatitis and, and also the candida, is that these moisture is getting on the skin. In the case of candida, it's, of course, causing um, fungal issues. So what we do in these instances is we use a powder, a pectin powder, um, on most patients. Every once in a while, we find someone allergic to it. But drying up that moisture, if you use a pectin powder and a skin sealant, and you can see kind of around the dermatitis there, there's a white crust. That's what we do over all of the skin so that when that barrier goes down, it'll stick nicely. The barrier is infused with pectin as well. So that will fuse together and help heal some of that. But they definitely need a different style barrier. And most of the time, um, you know, it's really helpful if you can hook them up with an ostomy nurse um, who kind of can test the different levels of convexity. There's a lot, there's a lot to it, but, <laughs> um, but it, you know, it's always helpful to have somebody who can differentiate between candida and dermatitis. And then that bottom one is that epithelial stripping from taking that pouch off. We really, that we spend a lot of time focusing on how to remove a pouch in addition to putting one on. So. Andrew, I'm curious, uh, do you, uh, can you tell a lot from photos that patients send you in the chart? You know, I'm thinking about our patients who live far away mm -hmm. and may not have access to somebody, you know, um, is, is that a limitation for, like, it's a limitation, obviously, but do photo, how helpful are photos for you? Yeah, it's, it, of course, a limitation for patient. It's always nicer to be able to come in and actually practice and do these things. We have a wide variety of different, um, pouch barrier styles and product um, manufacturers. But one thing that we can do is, um, because people do want to come from far away to see Dr. Shanker, so sometimes we actually will do, um, you know, we can talk over the phone. Every manufacturer of these, um, the products, <clears throat> so pouches, all of the accessories, excuse me, <clears throat> um, you're able then to actually call those um where the patient can call those manufacturers and they actually have certified ostomy nurses right there that will help them and say, you know, it sounds like you need a convex barrier. So they'll send them those or we'll call and we'll tell these manufacturers what we want sent. And then we can talk to them later once they have the product and kind of go through um, step by step what they can do. And, um, you know, patients don't believe us, but it is huge life changing thing when you can sleep all night without worrying about getting stool all over your clothes and bed. So. Yeah. Um, I, I wasn't aware that, uh, that they had ostomy nurses also as part of the, I think. Yes. Uh, fantastic. Yeah. Yes. Uh, look, all right. Let's move on. To that slide. There we go. All right. Um, so other late complications include, uh, prolapse. This is, uh, again, I create the problem and Andrea managed the problem. <laughs> this is Bridget. She had Crohn's disease of the terminal uh, ileum, a, a surgery I did uh, with uh, Dr. Dr. Diaz. Um, she uh, had declined treatment um, and her disease progressed, ultimately leading to being admitted to the hospital, being malnourished, being on steroids at TPN. And um, uh, she was not improving. And ultimately, we had to take her to the operating room. So she had a robotic converted to open ileocytectomy. Uh, takedown of her ileosigmoid fistula, sigmoid resection with uh, anastomosis. And so she had the end loop. So she had it through the same apparatus and endoliostomy. And then the mucous fistula portion was her uh, right colon. 
you know, the plan was to uh, manage her, uh, you know, and close her with the Kona West after she received Crohn's treatment and was in medical uh, remission for a period of time. You know, the risk for her developing prolapses, once we did the surgery, she like had an excellent recovery, felt better, was in a surgical remission, able to start medication. She actually moved to New York City uh, for a job. I came back for her, her Kona West procedure. But of course, uh, once she could eat, she gained a bunch of weight. And at risk for prolapse, I, you know, one include la lack of bowel fixation, which is what we see um, with the small bowel, especially uh, when we're making these ostomies, um, but also an increase in the size of the aperture. And we do have two things coming out of one aperture, uh, which makes it a little bit bigger. And when people gain a little bit of weight, they also get some increased abdominal pressure. So these are things that um, can lead to a prolapse. And, you know, if your long-term goal is a reversal and you know you you don't want to sort of do a revision uh, uh then we we uh talk to people like uh andrea to help us manage this so what are your tricks for managing this type of thing until like a second stage operation yeah so a lot of times when people come the reason that they'll call us is they'll say my stomach got huge or that they'll complain of some pain because at the junction there where that's coming through, it can cause some extra pressure. And so what we do is we bring them in and first thing is to make sure they can reduce their stoma. Um, to do that, um, because we just wanna make sure that they're safe, that the stoma is gonna stay in position. You have them lie flat, uh, absolutely supine, and you want them to look up at the ceiling because it elongates that um, the abdomen there. And so we teach them just to fold that stoma right back in. Most of the time it can. Sometimes we have to work with it a little bit. Um, granulated table sugar actually will also reduce a stoma. There's been a couple times that it has been emergent. And so we've, you know, packed somebody with table sugar in a huge pouch and sent them over to the emergency department. So, um, but this, the big thing is stoma reduction. And, and they have to wear to, uh, at all times when they're out of bed. Uh, they have to wear a hernia support binder. They need to lie down, reduce their stoma, and put a binder over top of that because we need to hold that so that they don't come out and have any strangulation. And of course, that then we have to send them right back to the surgeon. So <laughs> never happen. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, they come to the ER uh, and yeah, with the table sugar. And I agree that the uh, reduction and teaching patients to do that is key. Um, and our residents are amazing and really know how to do that um, well uh, because I've created opportunities for them to learn. <laughs> so uh, they, they do reduce it and sometimes some muscle relax it in the emergency room uh, will also help that go back in. Uh, and that's how we temporize it. If it's something that you think is going to be more permanent than some of the issues I brought up before, like a risk factor for prolapse and needing bowel fixation would be to create a retroperitoneal tunnel during the time of that operation. Uh, that would be sort of like in the original sugar baker fashion to bring that up, uh, that ostomy up. And that's when you're saying like, hey, if I'm not gonna reverse this ostomy or if it is permanent and they have prolapse, then you're gonna wanna think about, um, you know, you're getting to a stage where you can do an elective hernia repair um, uh, for that prolapse or you know, I'm sort of assuming there's a hernia component to it or do some uh, retroperitoneal fixation or fixation with the mesh. Um, so long-term goals are to temporize this until the reversal or surgical revision if it's going to be a permanent ostomy. Uh, peristolal abscesses and fistulas. Uh, these are often an early complication if there's contamination during the surgery, um, uh, but often can be a later complication in the setting of Crohn's disease. You know, the last person I, I had two people with this. One was a Crohn's patient and another was a, a person who uh, uh, developed like a fistula from the stoma outside, the part that was outside the, the skin, but it fistulized over after like an emergency surgery and uh, went back for a uh, revision. Um, so you want to, so if they have an, an abscess and a fistula, you want to sort of evaluate that and your goals with that is to say like, is it coming from a fistula or from the stoma itself? If it's coming from the stoma, what part of the stoma, how like proximal is it from where it's coming out of the skin if you can't see it readily? And is it coming from an intra-abdominal source? Maybe not from the stoma itself, but from another abscess or another problem. So that's going to maybe involve some imaging and endoscopy to figure out where that's coming from. You know, uh, 
if it's more, if it's coming from an intradotal source, then you're going to figure out the best way to drain that, be it interventional radiology or a surgical intervention. If it's more superficial and coming from close to the top of the stoma, or is it an abscess that you have combination? You know, I think the uh, important part here is that you want to do your drainage outside of the pouching area. So we sort of think of two options. If there's like an abscess or a fissulate here, and there's not like a real abdominal component you have to address, you can either ask IR if they can place a drain and it just make sure they're sort of play, placing it outside that wafer. If you're going to do it in the operating room because maybe you need to do some debridement or there's other concerns you have going on, then you'll see uh, us make incisions or sometimes packy stick shaped incisions or incisions. Again, that's going to be outside the area where that wafer is going to sit. And then we're going to uh, enter the cavity, really do a, a washout and debridement. And often we some kind of rows or drain in place. If you see that drainage is really coming out of the mucocutaneous junction, we may just open that up more. If we don't have a concern that we have like some necrotizing infection or something, we have to really do a significant agreement on. Um, and uh, maybe just open that up and provide a little drainage there. Uh, I don't know, Andrew, if you have other suggestions for this problem. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, it, it just after we know how it's going to be medically managed, sometimes you just have to get people through um this and so you know if this is something that we had to pouch around they make actually advanced skin protectants that will um for an extended period of time protect any exposed skin so we do a lot of that or two-piece pouching systems where they can take the outer pouch off and then recrust several times a day just to protect the skin so that you know we can still manage until a um, surgical intervention has been uh completed so um, so yeah, all the, all, and it's all sort of about, uh, working with your wound ostomy, uh, team because all of the sort of specialized wound care for type of person is are just really unique to the type of problem we're treating. Um, retraction stenosis, this is another, uh, uh, patient, uh, Andrea and I share. Rachel, um, is a woman, uh, morbidly obese and unfortunately diagnosed with rectal cancer in uh, 2021, she underwent um, the total neoadjuvant treatment. She got radiation and chemotherapy beforehand, uh, but then unfortunately lost a follow up due to mental health issues, lots of psychiatric hospital admissions, and suicide attempts, and didn't come back to see us again until two years after she completed treatment. When she completed treatment, she did not have a complete response to rectal cancer. And so she started to have some regrowth there. And she came in with an obstruction and uh, she needed to go for a diverting ostomy. And this was a diverting loop ostomy uh, that my partner did. And I came in to also, um, you know, support her through that. She had a very thick abdominal wall. This was a loop ostomy. And the one itself was uh, just so distended with stool, just very hard to like navigate and touch. Uh, but we did bring up an ostomy and it was really at skin level. And of course it started uh, to retract uh, and, and fall in at that time. And, and uh, at the time that this was happening, she once booked for a pelvic acceleration. We were also trying to manage her um, for a, a short period of time until we could get her to surgery. Um, and so uh, with retraction, I think it depends on uh, and stenosis. It, depends on what your next steps are and sort of the extent of it. So if we see people early enough, well, like from a surgical side, we'll do some, teach them to do some hair dilation of the office, make sure um, that uh, there still is like thickened enough that it's also helping to step the area open without being so hard that it's going to cause a blockage in and of itself. So some like dietary management, fiber management, and uh, we'll get, we'll have them buy a hair dilator on Amazon and then bring it in so that Andrea can sort of continue to go through with them, uh, how to use it. Uh, do you have other suggestions, Andrea, for managing? Um, another thing that um, when somebody gets, uh, you know, has stenosis, especially to this extent, this stoma, you know, Dr. Schenker was able to make actually a beautiful stoma for her, um, you know, at bedside. But the for her, we want to keep them in a convex barrier because that convexity kind of puts just a little bit of tension at the junction so that because you can see that, you know, that was a wound, that big separation there, and it healed and actually epithelialized. Then that scar is much more rigid than her abdomen. So, um, yeah, Dr. Schenker was able to take all that. And now she's 
dilating. We still have her do it every day. Just we want to keep this stoma nice and open. She knows how to do it. And she's doing great. She only comes in once a month, I think, just for checks. And she's doing wonderfully. Yeah, yeah. It's about the level of the skin. And Andrea's right. I did take the skin off at the time. Her surgery was two weeks away. And so I numbed her up and we did like a procedure in the office. I just went to see the extent of it first and open it up. And then I was able to suture again to like a new mucocutaneous junction and that provided her enough with the surface that the patient could see and dilate. And she lost a little bit of weight. And like, unfortunately, she had tumor regrowth and went through more chemotherapy, which is why Andrea is uh, saying the stoma is still doing well. Uh, now she is booked uh, uh, for next month. So we'll see. Uh, it goes for her, but uh, uh, yeah, the convex barrier is key point. I like doing home dilation. Um, so this is uh, uh, a patient who, uh, now in the center picture here, you can sort of see the sort of extent of her like abdominal adiposity. So this is uh, like a previous midline scar, and this is... Um, you know, the level portion of her abdomen. So this patient, um, Angelica, had a cheek couch remotely that was open and then was developing a lot of like pain and symptoms and wanted a diverting ostomy at, at a very complex surgery um, where uh, uh, they went to give her a loop ostomy. And, and so it was a loop, but part of uh, like the part they matured uh, what actually ended up being the venting end at the side uh, that was working had pooped underneath her skin. So she got fecal contamination underneath the skin. So they took her back to the operating room uh, to repair that. But you can uh, see not only did she require a, a wide agreement, but the stoma still wasn't reaching like above the level of her skin, even the working side. Um, so they had to use a lot of fully captors and things like that to help manage um, where the stool was coming from. This first... Um, uh, you know, required uh, but lots of sort of went to dry changes before a vac was being uh, able to be put on it. And so eventually in June, this is what it had looked like. So it's just a, a stoma like sitting in a crease there, um, you know. Uh, and so it, for for these type of patients, Andrea, where you have just this large abdominal wall, the stoma in a crease, you know, what are your tips for that? Yeah, what we actually did for... Angelica is, um, I had her come in so for a while until we could get that. And she actually had a wound vac on well into her, you know, after she was discharged home and she would come in uh, twice a week to have that changed. So we were actually pouching right over top of, of the back, which actually, believe it or not, was holding her dressing longer because it was pulling all that fluid away um, that normally would seep up underneath the barrier. But we had her come in and New Hope Labs makes an alginate mold. So um, I had her come in and you can do it over broken skin. So we did a mold after we had 90% healing and uh, we take that off and they make a mirror image that that barrier will fit exactly into every crease. Um, she was, once we stopped the wound back, she was changing four to five times a day. And now she changes her pouch twice a week with that barrier and is doing amazing. So do you like mold it specifically to mm -hmm. her? How often do you have to change that mold? Um, so the great thing about that too, is that, you know, Angel has kind of changed shape a little yeah. bit. And so we have sent pictures to New Hope and they have adjusted that barrier for her just based on those photos. And, uh, probably the biggest success story I've had with, with those New Hope, uh, custom barriers, because this has changed her life. This woman travels and, uh, it's very, um, she her profession requires a lot from her and she's doing fine now i think she thought she wondered for a long time how she's going to be able to do it so we're really excited for her oh that is um uh, that's amazing and so do you need a 90 percent healing rate before you can put those barriers on so you can do it um over broken skin okay but I do, once we have the mostly <clears throat> the shape of the abdomen uh we can go ahead and do it because they can just through photos change okay. the wow. um, level of convexity. Yeah. Yeah. It just, yeah, it's, so it sounds like the back was helping absorb back fluid and what's yes. prior was a good time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
uh, yeah, Candace uh, was a woman who had uh, metastatic cancer at her first stoma site. She was a person who had a, a like a obstructing cancer. I'm just uh, making sure we're staying on time. Obstructing cancer. Um, her um, completion surgery was ultimately delayed. Um, you know, the plan was to give her a diverting lobostomy, and then she was going to come to me for uh, the definitive surgery, but she coded on her table. So from the time she was diagnosed with the cancer to the time she got her definitive surgery after being evaluated by cardiology and being cleared to go ahead with surgery, um, she ended up from her frailty getting sort of a Harvins type procedure and ostomy. And then she had uh, some folliculitis and metastasis like at the stoma site. So for her, she got radiation treatment. So you can see she's also a little bit in a crease here. Her body had also changed shape a little bit. And I think that crease bothered her. Um, I think Annika mostly had taken care of her one of her other uh, amazing wound ostomy uh, team members. Uh, and so the radiation did great, I think, from from the ostomy point of view. But I think from the cancer and all her other treatments, I think she has uh, just some chronic pain in that area. Mm -hmm. She still has cancer on the inside around that area, too. Um, and so I think we talked a lot about these dermatologic problems. Is yeah. there anything else you would add? Yeah. One thing that um, we've noticed a couple of times, so with Candace, the, the last one, she did start radiation again, and she has, uh, appears like she could have a little bit of a radiation burn. And so um, what we did is we mixed meta honey with stoma adhesive paste and used it, and it cleared it right up. So, um, so inflammation is also, you know, those burns are really, really hard and they can happen spontaneously next year. So, um, but you know, we're finding just focus on inflammation and it really does help that skin. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, all right. So finally we, uh, um, have sort of the, the top of my, uh, uh the top of uh, my screen from the the zoom is blocking everything, but you have um, sort of early complications that can be emergent or non-emergent, such as retraction and necrosis. So some of the things that we covered today and the non-emergent dermatologic being the majority, I think of what we see. We talked about like identifying congestion or ischemia and the extent of the ischemia. And we've talked about mucocutaneous separation, again, the extent of that. You know, late complications, again, emergent, urgent or non-emergent. A stoma hernia um, uh, or retraction or stenosis becomes emergent if it's causing an obstruction. Non-emergent, um, again, retraction and stenosis with the dilators and the pouching systems. Um, stoma hernia, again, uh, wearing that uh, uh, or prolapse wearing that belt or pelt all the time. Uh, those are all things uh, that we want to think about. Some other things are, are just some issues that require maybe not always local treatment. Uh, so for example, stoma varices. If you have a person with bleeding varices, you can immediately address the issue with pressure, epinephrine, soaked gauze. Um, sometimes uh, like a stitch may work, but not always, but they really need um, an evaluation of the cause of their varices and addressing that underlying cause. Pyoderma gangrenosum, uh, while we didn't talk about that in detail, today, you know, first uh, is a lot of like topical local wound care, but really understanding that this usually is reflecting uh, disease activity of Crohn's disease and uh, understanding what their treatment is for that. And knowing that reciting or moving the stoma will likely cause the same problem in a new location if we're not treating the underlying cause. So most fistulas and abscesses, we talked about like how we drain those and how we care for the skin. Metastatic disease and the radiation uh, burn, which is a uh, uh, great uh, to think about ways you can uh, provide uh, local skin care for burn. And uh, skin irritation can be, you know, what the patient's doing, uh, comorbid factors, you know, having that appropriate appliance. All those things are uh, uh, are good to think about and talk to your wound ostomy nurse about. Uh, any other final thoughts, Andrea? Um, you know, I, I guess just, um, I, I have done this with Dr. Shanker before, and um, she focused on a couple of things that I've really learned a lot in the past. And one is that, um, you know, estimates need to be independent if at all possible. Um, we get so many people that come in and they have their parents or their spouse pouching them. Um, 
It's a lot harder um, for the patient to actually understand they need to manage this and they need to be able to manage the wound. So um, we really, really, really like to get patients independent and in managing all these complications themselves. So oh, it's yeah. a new wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it, uh, even though it's not the focus of our, our conversation today, the mental health aspect of it and the impact um, on like all the relationships and it, like it, re-engaging in society is mm -hmm. just really important that they see that they have that autonomy with their health care. So uh, many, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so I apologize, Dr. Shinger, but many, um, the UOAA um, has, you know, people are putting out support groups and we are very excited because this week we have our first Ann Arbor support group. And so They'll, you know, we're going to be, uh, the ostomy nurses will be at some of those, but that's a great thing. If there's a local support group, they're going to be able to get hooked up with an ostomy nurse, with a wound ostomy nurse actually, and that can work directly with a surgeon. So encourage those because we, we are really doing that there so we can get patients more resources. Like, yeah, I love knowing that. And if you don't have that resource, um, Andrea has helped me find uh, patients that I pre that you've previously taken care of to talk to some of my patients yes. who have been afraid to get an ostomy or go into surgery. And all of those patients have found those individual connections extraordinarily helpful. I agree. Um, yes. So sometimes if you don't have that resource, you can help them make a one-on-one -on -one connection. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we talked about the patient factors, the type of stomas that are important, considering like... Uh, the uh, obstacles and complications, early complications we've talked about, retraction, ischemia, mucocutaneous separation, and late complication. For patients with longstanding uh, permanent stomas, a template and documentation can be part of routine care. Um, and, you know, making sure you're probing them, having some standard intake form uh, to really help you know if there's a change can also help you uh, communicate with other providers. And I thank everybody for their time. Thank you very much. Excuse me. This is great. Thank you both so much. Um, we have some questions for you. Uh, Dr. Mulkey is asking, when do you decide on loop ostomy versus end ostomy with mucus fistula? And where do you typically bring uh, out your mucus fistula? Is it the second uh, ostomy site through the midline incision? Um, if I'm doing uh, the end loop, so I'm bringing them both out through the same aperture, which I'm going to do a majority of the time. When I do that, you know, I think I do that a lot um, with Crohn's disease. So um, typically if I'm going to uh, plan on reversing somebody in the future after they're in, you know, remission and they're optimized, um, I don't want to create... Um, one anastomosis in the standard fashion, or even in a you know, like, or I don't want to do a chrono S under like an emergent condition. Um, and then, uh, you know, have that anastomosis be created in a more inflamed condition and then bring up another ostomy that has to be, you know, reversed later and that have that have two anastomoses. And what do I do with that loop ostomy? Do I make that like a chrono S? So I think, I think, uh, especially for my Crohn's patient. I think that I want one anastomosis to be made under the most optimal conditions for the patient. I want to make sure they're in full remission, that, you know, they've been completely worked up on medications, on their biologics. And um, and so in that way, I don't want to make an ostomy that may not work. I mean, make a connection that may not work that way. So those are patients where I'm more likely to say I'm going to make one anastomosis, hopefully, and, um, and uh, therefore bring things out through the same aperture. Um, and uh, and then do the Kono S once they're totally controlled. Uh, especially for those patients, I may do a, a surgery, but you know, more proximal in the small bowel or you know, in the anal canal, they may still have the active disease. So you really want to make sure that you have total disease controlled to the best of your ability, and that's where these multi um, disciplinary teams are essential. So that's a time when I I would do that if we're talking like. Um, you know, a diverticulitis, a rectal cancer, I'm going to likely do a lubostomy, you know. And um, I would say, when do I do, you know, there's no part in vast rule and you're individualizing to every patient for different reasons. I may be more likely to do a Hartman's if I'm doing like an emergency surgery. The diagnosis may be unknown if I think that the connection may not go well or they're bowel is really full of stool. And even if I divert them, they could still leak a whole bunch of stool into their abdomen. 
those are like individual patient conditions um that's sort of like assessing at the time if you know what there's always more than one right answer but i think uh you know those emergency surgeries it's a little bit like a poker game you don't know all the cards your patient is holding and so you're just taking the data you have at that time to make your best decision Definitely. Thank you. Um, Dr. Shostak is asking, what are your recommendations to tell people how to remove their ostomy bag? Do you work closely with the home health with patients who are being seen at home? What's the best resources to guide the patients online for pre op post-op recommendations? Uh, Andrea, do you want to try that one? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we work very, very closely with home health. Unfortunately, our home health doesn't have an ostomy nurse. So what we we do is we bring the patient in and, um, you know, if if a patient has home health, one of the challenges we have is if a patient has home health, but they have a Medicare contract, the contract says that home health has to purchase their product. And so we that's sometimes the biggest challenge is getting the right product um, based on what home health is ordering. But Absolutely, it's it's very very important because we need them often to follow up with product orders and things, as well as um, you know we have always offered for home health to come in also with the patient at that first appointment. Not always possible, you know, but we do offer that. As far as taking the pouch off, I'm so glad you asked that because that is a big big thing that we have to teach right away. Is we use uh, some. Uh, safe solvents and adhesive removers because the skin gets thin over time, especially if they are having leaking. And so to prevent that adhesive injury, we want them to use an adhesive remover, a safe adhesive remover. Anything that comes from um, any of the main manufacturers is safe for, for a stoma or a wound. So did I answer all the questions? Was there another one? Um, do you have any resources for online uh, for the patients? Like, do you have any go-to? Yes. The um, United Ostomy Association of America has wonderful resources for ostomates. They can hook them up with, um, you know, a relatively close ostomy clinic um, and things like that. And sometimes it just takes one appointment, you know, if, if somebody can just get in for one appointment, they can uh, really hook them up online though um their other big thing is going to be the manufacturers so uh those they're going to also be very helpful we work closely with them as well so awesome thank you uh, dr modi is asking i think about that um very complicated j Potch patient who had the diverting nucleostomy how did you manage the um wound back like who changed it who was responsible the yeah, one day of all the examples that I showed, that was um, uh, not my patient, though I rounded it and met that patient many times. But yeah, Andrea, right? You the wound bag and in the hospital. Yes. And actually, in the hospital, you know, while it was um, the resonance, we, yeah, like the wound was so complicated. I think um, the we called over to the Cleveland Clinic also just for some other recommendations. Um, and uh, got many different um, wound care people in the hospital involved in that care acutely. So I think that it depends on what institution you're working at. Um, but you know, we uh, most of us will have access to plastic surgery to, and hopefully in a tertiary care center to like a wound care nurse or a wound care team. Um, and so uh, in the beginning, we had like multiple opinions on how we were going to manage that. So for the first couple of weeks, because I, I was on call uh, initially, um, you would have dressings like falling off and just coming off all the time. It took a little bit of trial and error to get the the right thing going. And when we started getting some healing, then the, the VAC was able to stay for longer periods of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Got it. Yeah. Very challenging. Um. Dr. Wong is asking, uh, what would an ostomy nurse want to uh, want the surgeon to know? Oh, <laughs> um, you know, gosh, it, it's hard to say. I mean, and I'm not just saying that because Dr. Shanker's here, but we get very, very good stomas. Um, our inpatient team will, you know, help as far as marking and things go. They're actually, from my experience, had um, 
you know, when it's possible, the stoma's in a good spot. We get lots of instances where it's not. So that's kind of a hard question. We, I think that, um, you know, we have good communication and we know what's coming to us. So, um, the, the surgeons also have given us a heads up in advance when they know a patient is going to be getting an ostomy. And that's been helpful to have people come in in advance sometimes just to see that, well, to meet us, first of all, because there's a lot of anxiety that comes with that first appointment. But um, there are so many resources we can give them beforehand, but they're at home learning about this. They know what a stoma looks like. So they're willing to look down at their post-op appointment and things like that. So, um, so yeah, that's, I think we have that good communication, but those would be great things um, to go back and forth with as far as location and, and just pre-op education. That's awesome. Are there any different um, aspects of marking children for ostomy or? Ooh, that's a great question. I, you know, marking is, um, it, it, on, on an infant, it's going to be easier. And of course, sometimes, you know, or it, that's going to change over time. I actually do not pouch infants. I don't mark infants and I never have. The products for infants are very, very different. And you really need um, that specialized care in like a NICU or a, a nursery setting because very, very different. Right. Um, which company makes the custom molds? It's called New Hope Laboratories and it's N-U and then Hope. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And um, Dr. Wong is asking, is it true that in Europe, people train their ostomies so they can go most of the day without a bag? If so, can we do it too? Yeah, we do it here. <laughs> yes, um, patients do stoma irrigation. Um, sometimes it's every other day, sometimes it's every day, but it's, an, it's uh, only for colostomies and really kind of lower colostomies. So what you do is, is you basically give yourself an enema through the stoma. Um, it is something, it, it, it's a big commitment. So we, we've had patients who come to us and they really want to do it and then they find out what's involved and they change their mind. Um, it's, it takes a good couple months to be able to build up, you know, it, it, causes a little bit of discomfort at first. Um, so it takes about an hour every time you do it. So patients have to have an hour of their day that's set aside just for um, irrigation. And then, yes, they don't even wear a pouch typically. They'll wear just a little cap or a dressing over their stoma. Yeah, and I would add to that that um, Separately, we do some, like, not as a first line, but sometimes people do uh, that type of irrigation if they have, like, a fecal incontinence to clear out the left side of their colon. They'll uh, buy, like, a there was a coloplast project for irrigation, and they'll come in with it, and Andrea will, like, just go through with them. It's not what they can use it. So it's another, you know, you're when your anal canal is like an ostomy and you don't have control, it's another way to help you with control. Um but they do uh, make uh, passion pouches for sexual activity and um, you, or for exercise or things like that. So they're like caps that you put on a stoma or very, very tiny bags. And so you may not do an entire like irrigation, but if you um, if your patient's going to plan to be sexually active, they can do like an enema or some irrigation and sort of um, and then like engage in sexual activity or exercise for like an hour or so and not worry about how it still come out. That's awesome. And do you use rods, Austin rods? <laughs> oh, do we use rod? Uh, you know, uh, every, like uh, every surgeon is a snowflake. Uh, one of my partners uh, likes rods and uses rod. Um, Prop, you know, I, I think the data suggest that you don't have to use that, right? I think that's what the data suggests. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, strengthening my gut muscle to, uh, to, to get there. I think a lot of times to be truthful, a lot of our patients are obese. So when we're struggling to bring up these ostomies, I would be more concerned about retraction or like a heavier colon than somebody with like a normal BMI. But I would say that uh, one of my partners uses rod. 
I will most of the time use like a red rubber catheter and have that removed before they leave the hospital, except in very rare instances. Um, one of my partners uses like a dissolvable suture, like a absorbable suture, like a PDF underneath it. Um, I use that once or twice, uh, like as well. And I think that if I have like the right person, I probably not do one at all. Sometimes if they, the stoma gets like really edematous or long, I'm t I take it out on rest of 24 hours, um, and that it's okay. So I think that everybody uses something different, um, uh, and we're all affected by the error in which we've trained, right? So but my most senior wonderful partner, uh, that uses the rod, you know, I was trained with the red rubber, uh, but I'm trying to sort of for the right person, get away with not using anything or removing that within 24 hours. Uh, -oh. and so, yeah, I think there's a variety of things to use. Obviously when we're making an ostomy, you know, um, uh, often it is not in an ideal situation. Uh, and so, uh, uh, it, I think it's clear that you get that, that you know, perfect anatomy that you're like, uh, yeah, I'm going to use nothing on that. But yeah. certainly if that happens or if it's, or if we're quick to remove it, I think that's the direction I'm going. Or mm -hmm. trying to. So I say. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Well, thank you so much. This uh, was great uh, and very educational hour. I'm sure uh, everyone who tuned in really appreciates the lecture and uh, problems and solutions together. Um, Thank you for joining us. Have a good night. You. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.